Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to our Facebook Live event. We're excited to be here in our accredited sleep center right here in Franklin, Tennessee. My name is Nate Carlin. I'm the social media coordinator at Williamson Medical Center. And I'm joined by Dr. Aaron Millstone, um, who is our sleep specialist uh, with our uh, physician practice, uh, Williamson Medical Group. Um, sleep is something that affects everyone. Uh, we all need it. So when sleep is your when your your quality of sleep is poor, it can have a huge impact on your daily productivity, and worse, uh, impact your overall health. Uh, Dr. Millstone is here to answer any and all questions about sleep. We have prepared a list of uh, questions to ask him, but we want to encourage you to um, ask live uh, while we're here. Um, so go ahead and if you have a question, just uh, type it in uh, in the comment section below or off to the side and. Uh, we'll do our best to, to address it. If we don't get through all the questions, then that's certainly an opportunity to bring Dr. Millstone back for a second time for another Facebook Live event. Okay. Um, if you're, after you, after you um, hear the Facebook Live, if you're still concerned about your sleep quality, we encourage you to follow up with your primary care physician. If you don't have one, then we certainly have several you can choose from. Uh, with Williams Medical Group, uh, you can find them at WilliamsMedicalCenter.org. So uh, let's get started. You ready? I'm ready. You're born with this energy. <laughs> I don't know about that. The natural. I enjoy so it. Good. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start with the million dollar question. Sure. How many hours of sleep does someone need? So that's a good question because I think that the answer is really dependent on the individual. So say we take a baseline of eight hours. So for an average adult. Eight hours is enough to really nourish the body and to wake up refreshed. But there are exceptions to that rule. So, for instance, if you look at young people, teenagers, for instance, teenagers often need more sleep. They need nine to ten hours. Unfortunately, lifestyle, schoolwork, sport, really affects their ability to get that nine to ten hours. And then on the opposite extreme, the elderly, as we age, we actually require less sleep. So in our 70s and 80s, we may only require five to six hours to feel refreshed. So the, the real answer to the question, Nate, is the number of hours of sleep you need is the number of hours to wake up refreshed the next day and not have any feelings of sleep deprivation, such as needing a nap in the afternoon, having a lack of focus, um, impairment in your memory, your ability to recall things. And so for each individual that differs, but on average, eight hours is a pretty good number for the average U.S. adult. You know, we're working more and more hours these days. We're busier than ever before. What would you recommend to patients, or what do you recommend patients to get those extra hours of sleep if they're not? Yeah, so one of the, one of the tips that I often give to patients is that if we're, if we're trying to increase the number of hours per night, one easy tip is to add 15 minutes onto the front of sleep and then 15 minutes onto the back of sleep. So you're picking up an entire half hour but you're only going to bed 15 minutes earlier, and you're only setting the alarm clock 15 minutes later. And that 30 minutes for many people, as you do 30 minutes a night for five working nights, really can make all the difference in the world between waking up refreshed and waking up tired the next day. That's great. Okay. Um, a lot of people check their phones before bed. Um, I'm certainly guilty of that. Fall asleep with the TV on. Are both those things bad for your sleep? Yeah, so we live in an iPhone nation where basically we check our phones continuously, look at email right before bed. Many people, the very first thing they do when they wake up after turning the alarm clock on is they pick up their phone off the charger and check the phone. I think the key with any type of diversion, whether it's white noise, such as having the television on at night, um, or having a white noise generator next to the bed, is to keep that white noise low enough so that it doesn't interrupt your sleep quality. The iPhone is particularly bad because what that does is that brings us from deep sleep to a lighter stage of sleep so that we can concentrate more. And so the more you do that before bed, the longer it takes to get into deep sleep, which is known as REM, which is the, the most refreshing part of sleep. So I encourage people to not take the iPhone to bed. And the way to do that is to leave the iPhone charger in the kitchen or in the dining room somewhere where you would have to physically get out of bed to go check it. The exception to that is if you're a physician on call. Then you have to have the iPhone next to you when you sleep. Of course, of course, yeah. All right, well, 
we uh, have our first question from our audience. Thank you to Neil and Franklin for chiming in. Um, he asks, how many minutes is best for a nap? And I'll, I'll add to that, saying our naps good. What do they do for you? So naps are good and bad. Um, naps are very helpful to feel refreshed, but if you add too much time onto the nap, then you affect your sleep quality at night. So the, the National Institute of Health recommends that if you're going to nap, that you limit that nap to just 20 minutes. Because if you go beyond that 20 minute mark, studies have shown that you greatly impair the consolidation of sleep at night, meaning it's harder to get into deeper sleep if you nap by day. So usually what I recommend is that you do the naps if you have to, but really leave the naps to 20 minutes or less. I also think that for most people, especially below the age of 65, if you do nap during the day and you feel like you need a nap during the day every day, then you're either not getting adequate rest at night or you might have some underlying sleep disorder that is preventing you from getting a good solid sleep at night. So that comes into play with diagnoses such as restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, something that is affecting the ability to get good deep sleep at night that in turn leads you to wake up the next morning unrefreshed. As the day goes on, you feel more and more need to take a nap in the late afternoon. But in general, the rule of thumb is 20 minutes or less. Does that apply for kids as well? No, kids are different. So as we mentioned, kids really need sleep um, for many things, uh, for growth, for immunity, a uh, good strong immune system. Um, naps in children are very common, especially in toddlers. Um, so not, naps should not be dissuaded um, from in young people uh, like toddlers. So I don't usually recommend uh, withholding naps from kids. Okay. And going back to the um, going back to the number of hours of sleep, um, what would you? Uh, how many hours of sleep do you need for for kids? What What do they recommend? So it depends on the age of the kid. Um, so the, the the period of time when we need our most sleep is usually infancy. So infants can sleep sometimes up to fourteen to eighteen hours a day uh, as an infant. In school age children. So in school-age children, which would be elementary school, elementary school children need 8 to 10 hours of solid sleep um, for growth and immunity. Um, for middle school and high school, that drops off a little bit to about 8 or 9 hours, and then college and beyond is usually the average of 8 hours, as we mentioned earlier. So, so there, there are a lot of different pillows out there. Yes. Um, everybody has different recommendations. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody sleeps with a number of, of different pillows. What is the best type of pillow? The best type of pillow is what's best for you. So there is no one pillow that works for everybody. So for instance, some people have a lot of rise in their body temperature during sleep, or they sleep in certain mattresses that, that give off a lot of heat. For those individuals, a cooling pillow is very helpful. So those are the pills, uh, the pillows that have gel in them that actually maintains a, a colder temperature on the pillow surface temperature. There are individuals that have a lot of neck pain at night during sleep. And so for those folks, you really want to look at a contoured pillow. Those are the pillows that have sort of the two waves to them so that when you side sleep, that you have some support for your neck. Some people require very soft pillows. Some people like hard pillows. What I recommend um, is that if you buy a new pillow, that you make sure that you have a return policy in case it doesn't work for you. And in addition to that, that you really look very carefully at the material. Um, so if the, if the pillow is too soft, if the pillow is too soft, then your head will sink through the pillow and you'll only have about an inch or two above the mattress, and that's no good for support. Um, if you wake up in the morning stiff in the neck or you wake up in the morning with headaches, then your pillow is probably not good for you and you need to think about a different pillow. And then likewise, if you wake up in the middle of the night sweaty um, or have to change your bed clothes because of sweating at night, then you really want to look at a cooling pillow. But there is no one pillow that is perfect for every individual, and spending a lot of money on a pillow is not necessarily the best route to go. And there are plenty of inexpensive pillows that do just as good as pillows that are over 50 or $60. What about mattresses? It seems like that can, all that information can be applied to a mattress, so what do you recommend? Identical. Well, the biggest thing with a mattress is a mattress needs to be changed out every eight years. So in the course of eight years, the support of any standard mattress really is lost. And so what we recommend is that you change out your mattress every eight years and that your mattress is comfortable for you so that you're not waking up in the morning with joint pain, stiff joints, pain in your neck, 
pain in your back. But like the pillow, there's no one mattress that works for everybody. And so the very best mattress manufacturers allow a 60 to 90 day period of time where you can literally take the mattress home, try the mattress at home, and then return the mattress if you're not getting a good quality of sleep. So before we went live, we asked uh, people on Facebook um, to give us questions uh, for you um, in case they weren't able to tune in today. And Joel from Franklin asked uh, if there is a routine you suggest for people to follow to get in the mood to sleep. That's a great sleeping. question. Yeah, so, so if you have trouble sleeping at night, there are a couple easy things that you can do that tend to make a very large difference. The first is temperature. So the, the ideal environment is keeping the temperature around 65 degrees, and that's the current NIH recommendation. That's a little bit on the cold side, um, but people tend to sleep quite well when it's, when it's cool in the bedroom. The other is to make sure that there's no ambient light in the bedroom. So use of blackout shades, making sure that the door is really shut tight, and taking your alarm clock and reversing the alarm clock so that the display is facing the wall and not facing you. I always tell folks not to watch television before bed, not to get on the iPhone before bed. So you want to decrease the stimulus in the room so that you get a better induction of sleep. And then most importantly, don't eat a heavy meal two hours before bed. So that diverts blood flow to the stomach, away from the brain, and you tend to be more focused on digestion than sleep. And so those simple interventions can make a huge difference in sleep quality. And then the final recommendation I have is always maintain a set sleep time and wake time. So go to bed at the same time each night, wake up the same time each morning. If you follow those good sleep recommendations, a better night's sleep is, is a definitive. So Jonathan just wrote in. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for writing in. My wife says I snore. I'm sure he's not the only one who hears yeah, that. I hear that once in a while. Should he be worried? Yeah, so snoring is, a, snoring is a, actually a very common physiologic response during sleep. And so many people, both men and women, snore at night. But snoring has not been associated with any risk for high blood pressure, for heart attack, or stroke. So snoring is very different than sleep apnea, where the airway closes during sleep. And, and the real difference is snoring is rhythmic, meaning that it happens over and over again during sleep without interruption. Where Jonathan would have to worry is if his wife said, hey, I hear you snoring at night, so that rhythmic snore, and then all of a sudden there's a period of time where I don't hear anything, and then maybe that lasts 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then you hear a very loud snore, and then the rhythmic snoring starts again, and that would be more indicative of apnea. But no, snoring can bother the sleep partner, the spouse, but snoring is not necessarily associated um, with any negative medical effects over time. So I would not worry unless she's seen those pauses. The other thing that I would just comment um, for Jonathan is that if the snoring is associated with fatigue the next day, so Jonathan's not waking up refreshed, then Jonathan may actually have sleep apnea and needs to be tested. Great question. Well, let's uh, let's talk about sleep apnea. Um, Wait, at this rate, we're going to need about an hour to get through all those questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, give you give your best uh, ele uh, elevator synopsis right. of it. You know, what is it, um, and what should people look for to maybe identify to you know, to take their take to their physician? I think that if I looked at patients and I I gave them some tips on what I would look for to be worried about my sleep pattern would be waking up unrefreshed most days. So I get my six to eight hours of sleep and I wake up the next morning and say, gosh, it feels like I never went to bed. So that, that is a worrisome situation. Somebody who develops new onset high blood pressure out of the blue. So all of a sudden you don't have any family history of high blood pressure, but you develop high blood pressure. That's another scenario with I, where I would want to test for a sleep disorder. Somebody who gains weight and has a lot of problems losing weight, sleep apnea makes it very, very difficult for people to lose weight. So that's another scenario. And then if I had a history of kidney problems, heart problems, if I had a history of stroke, those are all patients that should be tested for sleep apnea because within those medical conditions, sleep apnea is very common. So for instance, if you take the heart attack population, about half of those patients have sleep apnea. If you take the stroke population, 
it may be as high as 70% of those patients have sleep apnea. But again, I, I think the things that I would worry about most is unrefreshing sleep, new onset high blood pressure, inability to really lose weight. Um, those are classics for needing to do further investigation. It's, it's, it's amazing how much sleep affects so much in our lives. Sleep affects every aspect of our lives, um, from increasing the risk of having a motor vehicle accident, to having poor performance at work, to an increased risk of stroke, heart attack, restless legs causing tremendous discomfort during the day and at night, um, insomnia for patients not being able to fall asleep. Sleep is really, sleep is a field where it's an endless amount of effect on our day-to-day -day functioning. So I have a feeling that we're going to have to uh, bring you back for another Q&A. So Thank you so much, everyone, yeah, for, for sharing your These questions. These are good problems to have. Um, Cheryl wants to know um, about fans blowing on you during sleep. Does that have any effect on you? Well, as we mentioned earlier, the, the National Institute of Health recommends 65 degrees as the ideal temperature um, for the bedroom environment. So for a lot of folks, that's hard to do because you have a spouse in the room who might not like the environment to be that cold. So fans on one individual are helpful. The comment I would have about fans is I would always limit it to a small bedside fan where you could direct it directly at you as an individual and not affect your spouse. And then you really want to find a fan that is relatively silent so there's not a lot of ambient white noise from the fan because fans are good and bad. Fans can certainly cool body temperature, cool the room, but the negative of fans is that if they're loud, they can not only affect your quality of sleep, but also your spouse as well. Uh, we have a lot of great questions to choose from. Uh, I want to get to this one. I think that, I think that everyone will uh, enjoy this one a lot, especially now that we can buy wine in the grocery store. Yes. Uh, so how does wine at bedtime affect sleep? And does whatever you're going to say, does that apply to all alcohol? Did, did that question come from... Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That uh, came from uh, Rachel and Franklin. Okay, Thanks, Rachel. Rachel asked a great question, and, and the question is, how does wine affect our sleep quality? So all alcohol is a great sedative for sleep, all right? So, so alcohol is a muscle relaxant, so it decreases muscle tone in the neck. Alcohol is a wonderful sedative, so it, it gives us the ability to induce sleep. So if anybody has ever had trouble falling asleep, the recommendation from your grandparents was always to have a hot toddy which was basically a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of honey, and usually some sweetener as well. Um, the thing about alcohol is it's great to induce sleep, but if you move out four to six hours later, the alcohol is metabolized by the liver, and then there are enzymes released from the liver where you're looking for more alcohol to metabolize. And so although wine helps put you to sleep, wine actually leads to insomnia later in the night. So over time, if you drink a lot of wine at night, it actually leads to more awakenings in the middle of the night, and it's actually bad. So what the recommendation for wine is always to limit it to one to two glasses, no more, and then to keep the wine at least three hours before bedtime so you're not metabolizing it and waking up in the middle of the night where the body is looking for more alcohol to metabolize. Rachel asked a good question. So interesting. All right, Sally wants to know, uh, she gets eight hours every night, eight hours of sleep every night, but still feels like she needs to take a nap. Is that normal? So a lot of the answer for Sally's question is dependent on her age. So as we mentioned earlier, eight hours is a general rule of thumb for the average U.S. adult. But there are also what are known as short sleepers in this world and long sleepers. So short sleepers require less than four hours of sleep at night to wake up feeling refreshed. Long sleepers may need 10 hours a night to wake up feeling refreshed. In, in, in her case, what I would look at is I would look at risk factors for sleep disorder. You know, is she having other problems like morning headaches? Um, is the nap something she requires every single day? Is there a family history of sleep apnea? So somebody like that where they're sleeping eight hours and still needing a nap during the day, I would really want to screen somebody like that for sleep disorder. So come see us because I think I can help her. Well, that that, uh, that leads to a good segue. Is um, do they do they need to should they go to their primary care physician first, or can they make an appointment directly with you for a consultation? Either is appropriate. Either is appropriate. Really.
really depends on your level of comfort discussing those issues. You know, I always, I always consultation start with your primary care physician in case your insurance plan needs a referral. Um, if your insurance plan does not need a referral, we're happy to see those individuals. I just make one comment here, and that is at the end of the year, most insurance plans we've, we've met are deductible. So we have this huge number of patients trying to get in for sleep testing before the end of the year because the deductible has been met. So always, always plan ahead. Um, our normal wait time to get in for a sleep study at Williamson Medical Center is around two and a half to three weeks. But this time of year, it's pushed out a little bit, four to six weeks, just because of the number of patients that want to be tested. So we have about 10 minutes left uh, in respect of everyone's time. Uh, I know a lot of you are probably on your lunch break right now. Yeah, you need about triple that to get through that <laughs> stack of questions well, we've let's got. Let's try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, right. Let's talk about, uh, this is a good one, let's talk about exercise before bed. Is that yeah. bad or good? So I'm a huge fan of exercise. Um, I think uh, the, the current national recommendation is 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise at least four to five days per week to maintain physical fitness, to maintain good quality health. The problem with exercise before bed is your core temperature, which is the temperature in the deep part of the body, goes up significantly with exercise. And it can take up to three hours for your core temperature to go back down to a normal body temperature. If the core temperature is high, the body is unable to induce sleep. And so that actually leads to more insomnia, more difficulty getting into REM sleep. So ideally, I would want the patient to exercise four to six hours before bedtime, and if in a pinch, no less than three hours before bedtime. Because if you exercise before bed, if you get on that elliptical, your heart rate raises, you have a lot of sweating, your body core temperature raises, and you're just not going to get as much REM or deep sleep as you normally would need. So I, I'm not an advocate of exercise before bedtime. And if you're just tuning in now, you had mentioned earlier how it's better to be cool. Yes. To sleep, you know, six, keep your house at 65 degrees ideally. 65 so that, that is the ideal temperature. Works. Yeah, and I, I, would just, I would just add again, exercise does a lot for improving sleep quality as long as it's not right butted up against the sleep onset time. So again, a minimum of three hours, ideally four to six hours before sleep. Uh, and similar to exercise, uh, how, how is your sleep affected by what you eat before bed? Or do you, do you usually eat at all before bed? Yeah, so, so there are meals um, that have been shown to help with sleep quality. Um, so things like warm milk, warm tea, all of those have been suggested to help improve sleep quality. We already mentioned no alcohol before bed. And you really should avoid a high, heavy, fatty meal before bed that shunts blood supply to the stomach, away from the brain, and that can affect sleep quality. So we usually don't recommend sleeping on a full stomach. Um, sleeping on a full stomach does a variety of things, but the, the bad things that it does is it increases your risk of having acid reflux during your sleep. It greatly affects your ability to get into a deep quality of sleep. Um, and then if you eat right before bed, it's, it's hard to do two things at once. It's hard to have the brain focus on sleep and the stomach focus on digestion. And so eating before bed has actually been associated with a higher risk of obesity and a higher risk of weight gain. So I would avoid eating meals right before bed. A light snack is un not unreasonable, but not a heavy fatty meal. That's interesting. I, I, never, I never really heard that before. Yeah. As far as, you know, the, your body trying to do two different things at once. Yeah, and, and, and I would just also add that if you are going to have something before bed, um, that you don't make it too hot or too cold. Um, you don't want that stimulation to the brain when you're in the process of trying to shut down from the day and go to good quality sleep. Shelly has two questions. Um, thank you, Shelly. Um, one is, how does... Uh, being over, overweight affect uh, snoring and sleep apnea, and then are there, do we offer home sleep studies? Or, are, or I'm sorry, are they reliable? Great question, Shelly. So in answer to Shelly's first question, the reason sleep apnea has become such a problem in the United States is because obesity has really become an epidemic in the United States. So there's a direct correlation between the risk of weight and sleep apnea. The higher your body mass index, the higher the risk for sleep apnea. So the more weight you carry, 
the higher the risk that you're going to have sleep apnea. Likewise, the, the first intervention we recommend when we treat sleep apnea is not just considering one of the devices like CPAP or an oral device like a dental device, but it's actually weight loss. Um, in, in my practice of 20 plus years, I pride myself on being able to take patients off of those devices if they lose enough weight. So we have proven that you can lose enough weight to actually get rid of your sleep apnea or potentially move from, say, severe sleep apnea to moderate or maybe from moderate to mild. So, so there's a direct correlation between weight and sleep apnea as well as weight and snoring. The second part of Shelley's question is the reliability of the home sleep test. So many insurance companies today are trying to save dollars by doing the sleep study in the home environment. And that's good and bad. The good in it is you get to sleep in your own bed, you're uninterrupted, you get to set your own timing when you go to bed, when you wake up. Um, and there's certainly a lot less expense to a home study compared to a lab study. What Shelley needs to know is that if you have moderate or severe sleep apnea, the home studies are very, very good. They're very sensitive. But if you have mild sleep apnea, the home study may not be sensitive enough to pick up mild sleep apnea. So every once in a while, if we get back a home study and it's negative, and I really am suspicious that the patient has sleep apnea, I'll actually ask the insurance company to allow us to have the patient come here to the lab and do a lab study. Um, and, and oftentimes we prove that they have mild sleep apnea in the lab, even, the home, even though the home study was negative. And, and again, Shelly doesn't feel like she has to answer that question. There I would use a sleep physician, an accredited sleep physician, to help work through those issues. Just a few minutes left. Um, Jennifer asked, again, we asked uh, people on Facebook ahead of time yes. to send in questions. Uh, and she asked a question about uh, melatonin. Um, she's currently taking it, but she feels like it's not working anymore. Um, explain what melatonin is, why it's needed, how they should take it, and then what, what happens if they feel like it's not working anymore. So melatonin is actually a hormone, and it's a naturally produced hormone in the very center of the brain. It's produced from a gland in the brain called the pineal gland. Um, historically, melatonin has been called the darkness hormone. So it's released from your brain when the lights are low to help induce sleep and make you more, more tired, more fatigued. Over-the-counter melatonin comes in a variety of doses. So the first issue for her is, is she taking the right dose based on her weight? So there's a three milligram, a five milligram, and a 10 milligram strength. The other issue with melatonin is it needs to be taken fairly close to the onset of sleep within 20 minutes. If you take it two hours before sleep, it's probably not going to be very effective for insomnia. And then the third issue is there is some data that bright lights might affect the ability of melatonin to work. Remember, it's called the darkness hormone. So what I advise patients to do is if they take melatonin, always do it in dim light. And if they wake up, not to turn the lights up full in the possibility that it might affect the effectiveness of the over-the-counter melatonin. So those three issues, dosing, timing, and most importantly, keeping in mind that it's the darkness hormone, really come into play with melatonin. Melatonin is very well tolerated, doesn't have many drug side effects. Um, one of the adverse events is headache, but that's relatively uncommon. So melatonin is a starting point that people can use over the counter, but if it's not working for her insomnia, then I would encourage her to bring that issue up to her primary care or see a sleep physician she might need prescription medication. Let's, uh, let's get through one more question. Let's see what we haven't addressed. Um, let's talk about uh, restless leg syndrome to, to cap it off. Okay, so restless leg syndrome is a, a, a variety of symptoms. So, so the restlessness comes from the inability to stop the movement of your legs either at night or during the day. Constant fidgetiness of the legs, constantly shaking the legs, moving the legs. But the key is it's like an electrical impulse that starts low in the legs and migrates up the legs. And the, the only relief that the patient gets is getting up and moving, walking, moving around, exercising. 
So restless legs doesn't take a sleep study to make a diagnosis. You can actually make the diagnosis of restless legs based on the history of the patient. Restless legs also can be associated with leg movements at night, which are called periodic limb movements, and we do do sleep studies for that and do measure leg movements at night. There are new medicines for restless leg syndrome, um, and one issue that the patient may not be aware of is sometimes certain products that we take and ingest can make restless legs worse. So alcohol can make restless legs worse, caffeine can make restless legs worse, and anemia or low blood count can also cause restless legs. So I would start with my primary care physician, see a sleep physician, but again, there's very good therapy for restless legs, a very common problem, and a problem that increases with age. So we see restless legs at an increasing prevalence in an older patient population. It's a great question. Okay. Well, uh, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. I hope this has been very helpful. I know I've, I've learned several new things. Good. Um, and uh, I know Dr. Musselman, you are an active Facebooker, so if, you know if you want to, if we didn't get to your question, you know, still ask, and uh, you know we'll see if uh, we can get a few more minutes out of Dr. Millstone where he can reply to you. Um, but again, we encourage you to talk to your primary care physician, call Dr. Millstone's office. Um, if you don't have a primary care physician, please go to our website, WilliamsonMedicalCenter.org. Um, we have several great physicians uh, with our. Uh, physician practice, Williamson Medical Group. Um, again, it's WilliamsonMedicalCenter.org, um, and you can also find Dr. Millstone's uh, office information on there as well. So, appreciate you tuning in, and uh, look for uh, more Facebook Live events in the future. Thank you so much.